Hi. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the stiffness of interatomic bonds, and um, later we'll get into stress strain and Young's modulus, and this will cover sections 4.5 and 4.6 in Matter and Interactions, the textbook for our course, Physics 2010. Now, in the last lecture, what we did was we developed a model of a solid material as the atoms being these little balls connected by bonds which are modeled as little springs. Now last time we showed that the length of, the, of an interatomic bond is on the order of an angstrom which is about 0.1 nanometer. Now we talked about that in terms of if we're developing a ball spring model of a solid you know, Hooke's law says that f is equal to k delta x, where k is the spring constant, and delta x is the displacement from the equilibrium position. So knowing the spring equilibrium length is really important because then we can calculate the displacement from equilibrium. So we did that last time. Now in this lecture, what I'd like to talk about is what's the spring constant, right? If we're modeling this bond as a spring, what would the effective spring constant of each bond be? So, how stiff are they? Well, slinkies, they have a spring constant of about one newton per meter. Pogo sticks, about 5,000 newtons per meter. So, where are we at here? Slinky, pogo stick, what? Okay, well, we're going to develop this idea by exploring the concept of tension. So, remember, we mentioned this last time, tension is a pulling force. And it's a pulling force that exerts, that is exerted by a wire, rope, or chain, something like that. Now, if you have a wire, like a metal wire, last time in our lecture we talked about copper, right? If you put a copper wire under tension and you pull it really hard, that wire will actually stretch. And we can model this as the stretching of the bonds, which of course we're envisioning as little springs. And that's depicted here in the figure on the left. Now we're going to perform a calculation here to estimate the spring constant of our bond by measuring how much a wire would stretch under a known load. Okay, so let's assume that we have a copper wire and it's a really long wire, it's like two meters long, and it has a square cross section and the square cross section is one millimeter on each side, okay? And it's under tension. Now in reality, this wouldn't be just one bond, right? This would be many, many bonds. So. It kind of looks maybe a picture, a mental picture, might be this picture here on the right, okay, where you have this solid wire and you have these chains of copper atoms and the copper atoms are connected to one another by bonds. And so you can consider them to be many parallel long chains, right? Okay, so we have springs linked end to end, to end and we have side-by-side -side springs too. So how do springs behave when we have just more than one of them supporting a load? First, we have to develop a model for how to deal with springs in series with one another and in parallel with one another. So let's talk about springs in series. If you have two springs, for example, let's just start simple. Let's assume that we have two springs that have the same spring constant, like 100 newtons per meter. And we suspend a one newton weight from one of those springs that has a spring constant of 100 newtons per meter. Well, taking the magnitude of that force, you've got a one newton weight, so that would be one newton, and it would stretch the spring, um, and you would figure out how much by setting that equal to the magnitude of the spring force, which would be k delta x. So one newton would equal 100 newtons per meter times delta x. And solving for delta x, you would see that it would stretch that spring one centimeter, or 0 0.01 meters. Now, since these two springs are identical, right, and they have the same equilibrium length and the same spring constant, because let's face it, the bonds would, right, so let's model it that way, then that means that the second spring would also stretch 0 0.01 meters, right, just like the first. Okay, now picture in your head, if you will, hooking the springs end to end, okay? Now, what would happen is each spring would feel a weight of one newton on it. So that means that each spring would still stretch by one centimeter. But if you measured the total displacement of your weight from its equilibrium position, right, that would be two centimeters because each spring stretches one centimeter and so the weight goes down two centimeters, right? So if we solve for what the effective spring constant of the system would be, we would say K effective is equal or times delta x would equal to one newton because one newton is the weight and that means that k effective 
would be half of the spring constant that a single spring would be because the stretch is twice as far. So that's shown here in this picture at right. Now this would continue for as many springs as you have, and so we could write the formula that for springs in series, the effect of spring constant would be k over n, right, where n is the total number of springs that you would have. Now this is assuming, of course, that all of your springs have the same spring constant, and that's the model that we're developing here because we're assuming that all the bonds are identical, okay? Another big assumption in this, in this model that the weight of the springs themselves don't matter very much. Now that would be a very bad assumption for real metal springs because they do have a weight. And so, for example, the top spring would be supporting not only the load here depicted as this little block, but also the weight of all the springs under it. Okay, so that would be a bad model for that. Um, but maybe it's not too terrible an assumption for bonds, which don't actually have a mass to them. But the copper in our wire, as it goes down, it's supporting more and more copper atoms, and that might be something that we can't really ignore. But for the purposes of this simple model, we will ignore it here. All right, next, we've not only got springs hooked end to end, but we also have springs in parallel, okay? So let's develop a mathematical model for that. Let's imagine that you have two springs. Just like before, they each have the same spring constant, say 100 newtons per meter. If you hung a one newton weight from one of those springs, of course, just like last time, it would stretch by one centimeter, and so would the second spring. If it was by itself, it would stretch by one centimeter. But if you hook the springs side by side, then what would happen is that um, you'd have two springs supporting that load. And so that means that mg right, the, the amount of the force that each spring has to carry would be half of mg. And so for that reason, right, each spring would only stretch half as far as it did when there was one spring. So each spring would stretch half a centimeter because it feels half the weight. So our effective spring constant of two parallel springs would actually be double what a single spring would be because we would set k effective um, times delta x is equal to the load of one newton, right? And so we would get half a centimeter, and so that would have our spring constant. Now, if you extended this logic to a lot of springs, the formula for springs in parallel would be k effective equal to n times k, where n is the number of springs in parallel and k is the spring constant of a single spring. And yet again, this is for springs that are all the same, okay? Okay, so let's use these equations that we've developed here and figure out what's going on with the effect of spring constant for our bond. So remember, we've got a copper wire two meters long and there's a square cross section that's one millimeter on each side for the copper wire. So we need to figure out how many chains there are side by side and how many springs long each chain would be. And then we will have the number of springs in parallel and the number of springs in series. Okay, so in the last lecture, which you should watch if you haven't watched it already, we figured out that the center to center distance between atoms and copper was 0.28 nanometers. Now, that was an assumption based on what we call a simple cubic structure of copper, which isn't really true. The real spacing in copper is 0.254 nanometers. So I may as well use the real one. Okay, so I'm gonna do that here. If we have a two meter long wire, then if you model each one of these chains as being two meters long, then the number of springs that you would have would be two meters divided by the length of each little spring, right, or the length of each bond. So that would be two meters divided by 0.254 nanometers, 0.254 times 10 to the minus nine meters. And when you solve for that, you get the number of springs in series in each chain as 7.87 times 10 to the ninth, okay? Now, if you think about the cross section of our wire, it's a square and it has sides one millimeter. Now, let's picture just a little chunk of that and here's a little cross section of that. Let's think of our bonds as the lines in this little square here and let's picture a copper atom situated at the intersection of each one of those lines. And if you can envision what a top-down view of these little green balls here on the top row might look like, then that's what you'd have, right? So, each atom is going to take up an area here, 
uh, of 2.254 times 0.254. In other words, you've got a, a bond here, or you've got an atom here, you've got an atom here, atom here, and atom there. And so basically you could mark off little squares, um, and that would be the amount of area that each chain would take up. So each atom would take up an area of 0.254 times 0.254 nanometers, and that gives us 0 0.0784 nanometers squared. We can use this to estimate the number of chains in a copper wire that has that cross-sectional area, right? So if you do that, then the area each chain takes, I'm sorry, this, is, this should be um, 0.74, I don't know why that says that. Okay, so um, if you do that, then what you can do to calculate the number of parallel springs is to divide the cross-sectional area of our wire, which is one millimeter squared, or one times 10 to the minus three meters squared, by 0 0.254 nanometers squared. And that will give you the number of chains that you would have in that cross-section. So that gives us 1.55 times 10 to the 13. So that's the number of parallel chains, okay? So we've got the number in series and we've got the number in parallel. So how can we use that to calculate the effective spring constant of just one bond? Well, if we hang a 10 kilogram weight from our two meter long, one millimeter square wire, and we do some careful measurements, right? Let's say that it stretches by 1.67 millimeters. So this is our little experiment. And we did this experiment, say, and we measured the stretch, okay? So now we can calculate the load um, that the weight is pulling on our wire, and that would be mg, which is 10 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, and that gives us 98 newtons. Now, this, if we're modeling it as one big long spring, if we're modeling our wire as one big long spring, we would have k effective times that displacement s, right? And so s would be 0 0.00167 meters, and we can solve for k effective. And we end up with K effective is 58,700 newtons per meter. But now this is the effective for the whole wire, right? And remember, we have these two equations for how to handle springs in series and springs in parallel. K effective for series is K divided by the number of series, and K effective for the parallel is the number in parallel times K. So K effective for the entire chain would be a combination of those two equations. K times n para divided by n series. So if I set that up here, 58,700 newtons per meter is equal to K times the number in parallel divided by the number in series, and plug n for the number that I had in parallel in series, which was 1.55 times 10 to the 13th and 7.87 times 10 to the 9th respectively, then I can solve for K, and I end up with 29.8 newtons per meter. Now, this is just a back of the envelope calculation. In other words, it's just an estimate, but it's actually not a pretty bad one, right? I mean, if you take some spectra, for example, of atoms, you can actually measure an effective spring constant uh, for a particular bond, and this is the order of magnitude that you get. It's not off by a lot, so that's actually really encouraging. Now, although we did get close, I'd like to point out that there's a number of things that are wrong in terms of this calculation. There's a lot of assumptions that are made that aren't really right, okay? So for example, your book assumes a simple cubic arrangement for copper, but copper's not simple cubic, it's face-centered cubic, and that looks like this, okay? And so what that would mean is that would mean that not all your bonds are being tugged straight down, right? We have this mental picture of these chains of atoms with these springs in between them, and the springs are being tugged straight down and not sideways. And of course, that wouldn't be the case in a real material, not only um, is it face center cubic like this? But of course, the, um, the crystalline uh, domains could be arranged in any kind of random way as you look at real materials. So that's an assumption. Plus, we're only assuming that the bonds are felt by the nearest neighbors, which might not be a great approximation. And then finally, metals actually have slippage along certain planes of symmetry. And so some of that stretching comes from atoms moving around okay, as you deform the material plastically. And we haven't really considered that. We've kept it in the elastic region. Okay, despite all those, it's a pretty good model. Um, and so uh, it's definitely a nice conceptual model with a good mental picture. All right, I'm gonna stop there. We'll continue on with stress and strain in the next lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, let me know. And as always, I'll see you in class.